welcome everyone to the October meeting of the CED committee. I'd like to call the meeting the, uh, to order. Will the clerk take roll? Batra? Ortiz? Kame? Here. Torres? Here. Foley? Here. Thank you. We're at quorum. Uh, uh, I'd also, is uh, Council Member Torres on, or Ortiz online? Councilmember Ortiz is not quite on the line yet. Okay, great. I will make my statement when he is online. Um, I, before we begin, I'd like to read the following statement. The City of San Jose believes in promoting a safe, respectful, and inclusive environment for everyone to comment and provide input on actions and policies before the City Council. For this reason, we ask all speakers and attendees to observe the Code of Conduct and not disrupt the meeting. If any speaker disrupts the meeting by preventing the city council from doing its business or preventing other individuals from being able to safely participate at these meetings, they will be warned and may be cut off if they don't stop. Participants in this meeting may hear offensive speech that is bigoted, hateful, profane, unwanted, and unwelcome that disturbs them. If we do, we do not agree or endorse, endorse these statements, but will observe the right of all individuals to speak, notwithstanding the content or viewpoint. With that, I'm going to move towards uh, to the review of the work plan. There is a recommendation from staff to drop the rent stabilization program that was originally scheduled for this meeting. It will be added to the January, we, we redo a work plan in the spring and fall, or the winter and the, winter and the summer, I should say. So we will be looking to add it to the June through July, or June, January through June work plan. Rosalind, do you have anything you'd like to add? Thank you, Chair Foley. Um, yes, staff is requesting to drop this item. Uh, we have been engaging uh, stakeholders um, in our community on the rent stabilization plan, strategic uh, plan for quite some time. Um, as a result of the feedback that we did receive, um, we did update the draft strategic plan. Um, however, we realized that not all of our stakeholders have had time to review the update, and so we want to just allow more time to uh, meet with those stakeholders, uh, review the updated plan with them, and ask uh, any further questions. So we'll be bringing back to the CED committee um, early next year. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, before voting on this item, I'll turn to the members of the public. Do we have any individuals who'd like to speak on this issue? Yes, Paul. Uh, yes, Paul, so my horse, I can tell you unequivocally and there was not a lot of try to develop it is going to develop. Paul, we have a really bad signal where Paul, we have a really bad signal. We're really unable to hear you. Uh-huh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. No matter what policy you come up with, it's gonna fail. And here's why it's going to fail, is because you are not taking into account the market rate housing development has far exceeded and accelerated beyond the ability to stabilize the rents. Listen to this closely, because it's very simple. What you have to do, if you're really interested in stabilizing rents, trash your policy that you have now and institute a cap on market rate housing so that you stop the bleeding. You see, you're not going to succeed if you continue status quo and maintain market rate housing uh, development as is, like, like somehow or another, that's sacrosanct and that can't be stopped. Uh-uh. If you're serious about stabilizing rents, then you need to take into account the economics and the, the, uh, the politics involved in market rate housing. Now, if you do that, if you do this successfully and you put a cap on it of 50%, they can only meet 50% of their goals year over year until the other 
uh, ELI, VLI, until that stock of housing has increased. That slides the rents. It should pull up that need that you have right now. Mary? Uh, thank you. My name is Mary Helen Doherty. I'm a resident of District 3 and a current active member of the Sacred Heart Housing Action Committee. And we strongly support the proposed action to postpone receiving the rent stabilization program um, a strategic plan until additional outreaches to tenants can be conducted and revisions made. We are concerned that changes were made since the plan was released in July with very little input from key stakeholders for the program, in particularly tenants who are impacted by these programs. Uh, we are also particularly concerned about the 12th, um, the memo uh, from the Housing Department on October 12th that, with the subject of the rent stabilization plan status report. And that on page seven, item 3.9, explore the right to counsel notes that it's being deleted. And Shaq is, believes that the right to counsel is a very significant resource to prevent displacement and request further study of this item. So again, we are strong supporters of uh, providing for additional opportunity for input. Thank you very much. Catherine? Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, committee members. My name is Catherine Hedges. I'm a member of, um, well, ver various groups that aren't. Anyway, um, I agree with what Mary Helen Doherty just said and what Paul Soto just said. Um, the, yeah, we can't accept the report as written. Thank you very much. We have one in-person speaker. Emily, if you can come down to the podium. Hello, uh, my name is Emily Ann Ramos. I'm coming from SB at Home, and we are supporting the proposed action to postpone receiving the rent stabilization strategic plan until we get more additional outreach. Um, there were some changes since it was initially released in July, and, and we would like some more time to, to provide more um, outreach, particularly to tenants who are deeply impacted by some of these, that could be deeply impacted by some of these changes, as um, ARO tenants are about 30, 8,000 households in San Jose. So thank you very much. Um, looks like it's moving forward. Good job, y'all. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you, Council Member Ortiz. <laughs> Ortiz. <laughs> I'm thinking he's on Zoom and I'm getting him to make his statement. <laughs> but it's <laughs> Vice Chair Torres. That, that's quite okay, Madam Chair. I, I get confused. <laughs> I get confused uh, all the by time. my own name. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm called Councilman Ortiz in uh, community meetings a lot, so it's okay. <laughs> it's an honor. No, uh, it's. Uh, so, uh, no, I, one, I think uh, it's really important that um, we have tenants at the table when it comes to this, when, this, when it comes to this uh, program, this plan. Uh, we have been making great strides in, 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 making sure that our unsheltered population goes into housing, but we all know that the, the most important part of preventing homelessness is making sure that we are working with our tenants to make sure that they're not being displaced out of our valley or into the creeks and into our park. So uh, I do agree that we need to have more outreach, especially with our, with our tenants and the tenant groups and organizations that support tenants. So, so with that, I move to approve item B1. Thank you. Second. Second. Okay, Council Member Ortiz, since you are here, can you uh, announce publicly that no one over the age of 18 is present with you, if that is the case? Uh, yes, uh, Council Member Peter Ortiz here, and I am alone in my uh, kitchen. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to the vote. Patra? Yes. Ortiz? Aye. Kamei? No, he Aye. Say. Torres? Aye. Foley? Aye. Thank you. That passed 5 0. Great. We just have to do it once. Yeah. 
Uh, moving on to the committee reports, we have an economic development activities report. Welcome. Saludos. Good afternoon to the committee and members of the public. Uh, my name is Carlos Velasquez. I'm the public information manager for the Office of Economic Development and Cultural Affairs. Uh, I will be sharing a recap of our recent blog post, activities, and communications by our office in the previous quarter or the last two months. Uh, my presentation today is a, a month earlier than we usual, um, but still happy to share all of our uh, activities. Creating an inclusive and, uh, and barrier-free environment for people with disabilities is a priority for the city of San Jose, and it's why we supported our disability affairs team in August with their Forum on Disability Compliance for Businesses hosted right here at City Hall. I'm happy to say that we had 50 people in attendance the first time that the city of San Jose provided a space for stakeholders to share their um, perspectives on the barriers to accessibility and to discuss potential solutions. Thank you to council member and chair Foley and to vice mayor Kamei for uh, being present, being in attendance at the event and for your welcoming remarks. Uh, the forum modeled what an accessible event looks like with physical disability and language access practices all integrated into the event. This work continues and later this fall, the city will be hosting a webinar for small businesses to learn tips on how to accommodate all customers and to learn about the city's new grant program that covers disabled uh, access improvements for small businesses of up to $25,000. Uh, the date does say November 6th on the screen, on the slideshow, but we've had some updates this morning and we, will, we can get back to you on the confirmed date. We look forward to sharing information with your offices and to the public. We love opportunities to highlight those San Jose entrepreneurs and business owners who inspire us, and we did so in September for Latino Heritage Month via our blog and social media. Pictured on the slide is Connie Alvarez, who at 20 years old was thrust into small business ownership that her father started, Plaza Jewelers, on 1130 East Santa Clara Street. She now supports other small businesses as president of the Alum Rock Santa Clara Street Business Association. Also pictured is Joe Lerma Lopez, CEO of Luna Ki Mexican Kitchen at 1495 The Alameda. Joe got her start in entrepreneurship in the late 80s when she and her husband founded a record store in downtown San Jose. Her entrepreneurial path is an example of how one can find success by following their passion and wanting to make a difference. On social media, we highlighted local Latino businesses with connections to Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua, all Latin American countries that celebrated their independence days during the month. And on the cultural affairs side, I wanted to highlight some upcoming events where we can continue to celebrate our Latino community. This Saturday, the School of Arts and Culture is hosting their annual Avenida de Altares, an altar walk, which is gonna take place along the Alum Rock Business Corridor. Earlier that day in downtown, San Jose Multicultural Artists Guild will host their annual Dia de los Muertos procession that ends with a festival at the San Jose Museum of Art. And speaking of the museum, their exhibition of the preeminent Chicana artist, Yolanda Lopez, Portrait of the Artist, closes this weekend. Since the start of the pandemic, our office has focused on serving micro-businesses, immigrant entrepreneurs, and businesses located in historically under-resourced neighborhoods, many of whom were the hardest hit by the pandemic. In September, the city of San Jose distributed more than $140,000 in grants to 57 small businesses along the Tolly Road, Eastridge, and Evergreen areas, thanks to the District 8 Economic uh, Vitality Small Business Grant Program. These grants will help with, small, with property improvement, equipment, inventory, hiring, and marketing costs. More than half of the grants were awarded to women and all recipients were minority-owned businesses. We encourage the public to follow us on social media at SJ Economy 
or to sign up for our e-newsletter, e sjeconomy.com, to get information on future opportunities and resources that help small businesses and entrepreneurs in San Jose. North San Jose continues to be a hub for research and development within the city with a growing cluster of technology companies that make up more than 81,000 jobs. Last month, we celebrated the grand opening ceremonies for two companies, Neo Incorporated's new North America headquarters and innovation center on Zanker Road and Procept Biorobotics high-tech testing and production facility on Baytech Drive. Neo is a leading company in the premium smart electric vehicle market and Procept Biorobotics has been making waves uh, with its groundbreaking approach to treating benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is the most common form of prostate disease. Why are these companies choosing San Jose? Ganesh Iyer, CEO of, N of NEO, said it best. San Jose is the capital of innovation and the capital of Silicon Valley is San Jose. You look at all these innovative companies in and around San Jose and we want to be part of that innovative ecosystem to be in that backyard. We look forward to seeing NEO and Procept continue to grow and thrive here in San Jose. Earlier this month, the city welcomed more than 400 people from around the country for the annual Collaboration of Design and Art Summit, better known as the CODA Summit, a conference that explored the intersection of art, technology, and place. Rather than taking place in one venue, the summit took advantage of all of downtown San Jose. Activities took place at the Hammer Theater Center, City Hall, San Jose Museum of Art, and the Convention Center. Walking tours showcased the public art at the MLK Library, at San Jose State, and the many public murals throughout downtown. And attendees were also able to enjoy the art galleries along South First Street, thanks to the monthly First Fridays Art Walk. Thank you to the Office of Cultural Affairs team for co-hosting a great summit and helping downtown San Jose shine. Manufacturing Week is a national annual event in October to highlight the importance of the manufacturing sector to our local and national economy. Manufacturing is one of San Jose's most prominent industries with an estimated 77,000 jobs in San Jose that provides crucial support to our city's technology sector. Our office helped celebrate the week with our local manufacturing partner, Manufacturing San Jose. Together, we organized 11 tours of manufacturing facilities for more than 350 students from P Piedmont Hills High School, Independence High School, SIA Tech, Charter High School, and Goodwill of Silicon Valley. These students visited manufacturers such as Sunny Tech, Vanderbend, and Nextflex in, Sa in North San Jose, and Promotech, Peak Technology, and Nevadas Machining in South San Jose. These tours helped connect our youth to the, the idea and reality of a career in the manufacturing sector, which provides good paying entry level jobs and the ability to gain valuable skills that lead to career growth and economic opportunity. A big thank you to council members Batra and Ortiz, as well as council members Cohen and Dewan for joining us on these tours. And finally, connecting business owners and entrepreneurs to important resources and tools is, in, is how our office helps small businesses thrive. Every two weeks, we share on our social media pages a calendar of upcoming workshops hosted by the city or our partners, as well as through our email list. You can see on the slide a few that are hosted by our partners, Start Small, Think Big, and Score Silicon Valley, including one that we will be hosting on November 16th. Exploring Entrepreneurship, a celebration of National Entrepreneurship Month. Attendees are gonna have a chance to hear inspiring stories from local business owners on their entrepreneurial journey and visit uh, stations, each with experts on the 10 steps to start your business. Live interpretation in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese will also be available for this event. We look forward to sharing this with the com uh, committee and the community beginning this week. So this concludes our report.
happy to answer any questions from the committee. Thank you for, very much for that presentation. It's uh, nice to hear all the new businesses that are moving into the area that are promoting their businesses in San Jose and the effects that we're having on small businesses with grants. That's, it's wonderful news. Let's go to members of the public. Paul? Uh, yes, uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. That was an excellent, excellent report, Carlos. Thank you for doing the work that you do. I know it's only the beginning. You've been given the, the ability to use your creativity and your connection to the cultura and to the, to the community in order to center what needed to be centered a long, long time ago. So thank you as, uh, as, a, as a citizen that comes from the same community that you do. I'm very proud that you're there and that you're doing this work. And anytime it comes, you come up for a race, let me know. Let me know and I will write you a letter that you'll get, you'll get double what you ask it for. <laughs> now about the policy, this is why Viva Calle is, it's too important from what I just heard Carlos talk about was that we can't have certain issues as debatable. You see, it, 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 that's part of the racial equity uh, issue that I have. There's certain things that we need, and that's just all there is to it. What we do is we tell you what we need, and then you find it within the budget to do it. We're, 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 there's certain things that we should not have to go through this back and forth and, 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 and politicking over issues that are moral and ethical. And what it is is that this community has been vulnerable because they have not been able to exercise any political power or any budgetary power for generations. Now that we are in a vulnerable position because of the gentrification process that's already kicked off, we are, th that, that vulnerability is starting to surface again. And we need people like Carlos there mm -hmm. to do what he's doing and holding up our bandera. Gracias. Back to the committee. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Great. Uh, thank you, Carlos, for that presentation. I do have two questions. And I, I, I am super excited to see Connie Alvarez. That's, she does incredible work for District 3 and District 5, and so it's incredible to see how she has revitalized not only our small business, uh, small, small business community on, on East Santa Clara Street and Allen Rock, but throughout, throughout our city. A lot of people gravitate to uh, Connie Alvarez, and it's good to see that we support her. So the two questions that I have are, is there, is there a reason why uh, the Calle Willow Business Association, you know how we're trying to organize them, um, is not on the presentation? And I asked that question, Carlos, because I know that Paul Soto just talked about it, right? Calle Willow hasn't had this a business association for over 20 years, right? And OED, along with our partners in Sacred Heart, right, we've contracted out to Sacred Heart, and uh, my team have been out there, right, organizing a business association for Calle Willow, which, which has been over 20 years, right? And that's, it, that's extremely important, right? Right, the merchants feel that the city has ignored them, and they have, we have, right? But we are turning a corner and saying, no, the city cares for you, this business, association, this business district is important for our city of San Jose. It's important for our county, as a matter of fact. Uh, and so I just want to know why we didn't include it in the presentation since we have, you know, we've been rolling up our sleeves on this project. Yeah. Thank you for the question, Councilmember Torres. Uh, uh, Calle Willow is important to our team. Um, and I know that just in the last couple of weeks, last month or so, we've been working with your office to, to do some business walks uh, along the corridor 
and uh, to see if we can get them involved uh, with our holiday San Jose campaigns, Hot Shop Local campaign, which I'm looking forward to sharing in our next update. Uh, but I know that our team has been uh, working with, uh, going door to door with the businesses. It's uh, still in the early formation and outreach phase for the business association, but uh, I'll, we'd be happy to, I'd be happy to share with you a little bit more about the activities that we're doing uh, around Calle Willow. No, great. Yeah, I know. I, I know you share it with me, but I think it's important to share it with my colleagues uh, on this committee since we are the CED committee, right? And our general public as well, right? Because we also don't want to let them know that we are ignoring um, business districts like Calle Willow. And with that, the second question that I actually have is, I know that when I was with San Jose Downtown Association, I would be in charge of sitting at the monthly business association meetings that I believe OED organized. And so have, have those restarted? Because I know on our end, in my district, speaking about Calle Willow, we've had a couple of other business districts that, that have uh, been rebirthed. And so I think it's, it's very important that we continue to have these business district association meetings because we want to let all small businesses know throughout our city that we're committed to small businesses. So, and I see blog A coming up. <laughs> yes, good afternoon, uh, council members. Blog is the law, deputy director for economic development. So we are continuing to have the monthly um, neighborhood business district meetings. Uh, we've had a couple that have been rescheduled because uh, quite honestly, we were doing a ton of outreach on the shop local campaign for the holidays. Um, but we have been having them regularly and our intention is to continue to have them because we think it's very important for all of the groups to get together, to share what some of the challenges are that they face across the board, uh, to talk about potential solutions, and then really just to develop that camaraderie. So that's one of the things we've really been trying to focus on over the last six or eight months. Yeah, no, great. And I know a lot of folks on OED do a lot of great work for our small businesses, so kudos to our OED staff. And with that, I uh, move to approve item D1. Second. Great, thank you. Councilmember Batra. Thank you, Carlos, for that excellent report and organizing those tours of the manufacturing. General reputation is that U.S. Is basically does not do any manufacturing because we sent it all overseas. The showcasing that we have such advanced manufacturing spread around in San Jose. The one I came to obviously was in District 10. So not only that we inspired those owners or, or of the properties of the businesses, which was a minority owned, woman owned business, which has experienced phenomenal growth from 1999, half a million dollar to 11 and a half million dollars in 2022. The thing which I also liked about them was that the, the tour they gave to the students from different schools, those tours were so impressive in terms and informative that a lot of those children will go and take manufacturing as a career for themselves. Might go into engineering and all that because these are high school students, but some of them may go to the trade schools and join these people. So this was an opportunity where we created, your program created future employees, which we need, and the future entrepreneurs and supported the ones who are there. So I think showcasing this kind of an activity with the way you did it is phenomenal, very helpful, and very useful for San Jose. And certainly inspiring to the owners, and this particular one happens to be a daughter who took over the business from the father after 30 years, and is keeping growing in technology and money. So with that, I say thank you very much and keep doing more of it. The only thing you know, I had a request that do invite the students from District 10, this manufacturing facility located in District 10. The visitors or the students were all from other schools. Keep them, invite the uh, District 10 students as well. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. Okay. 
seeing no other comments from my colleagues here, I'm going to reach out to Council Member Ortiz to see if he has any comments on this topic. Sure, I'll, I'll keep my comments um, short. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. Uh, I wanna thank you, Carlos, uh, and the entire team at the Office of Economic Development for elevating uh, many of our powerful yet small businesses uh, on the east side, but yet throughout the um, entire uh, city as a, as a former you know, small business organizer and merchant organizer and activist. I'm really proud to see how far um, the city of San Jose has come uh, to elevating the, you know, women, immigrant, uh, um, people of color uh, uh, owned businesses. And it's important that our, our families uh, uh, and our youth know that entrepreneurship um, is a viable career path here in, in Silicon Valley. The, uh, um, the Valley of Technology and, and uh, Innovation. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, we're not just, you know, identifying a select handful of what innovation and entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship means in, in Silicon Valley, but broadening that tent to include, you know, districts like Calle Willow or Tully uh, on District 7 and 8, or of course, Alum Rock in, in my, my district. So I know that um, this, is, this is a new direction for the district. Um, and uh, for the uh, for the Office of Economic Development, so I appreciate that work. And I also just want to elevate um, the effort around uh, those tours for, around manufacturing for our youth. I, I grew up, went to high school here in San Jose, and Silicon Valley might as well have been on the other side of the earth because I didn't realize uh, um, the wealth being generated here and the job opportunities that are being generated here. So I, I sat in on those conversations and. Um, we asked questions and, and students were able to hear about actual careers that exist in their in their backyard. Um, I think the next step is to outline those career paths uh, um, with our partners in whether it's the community college district or San Jose State to then make sure that these youth know the tangible steps uh, needed to be taken in order to reach those careers. But um, appreciate your work uh, and the continued effort to, to highlight small businesses. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you all for your comments and for the economic development that's occurring throughout the city and for highlighting the grant program and Council Member Torres for mentioning uh, Calle Willow is certainly an important area for us to focus our energies on. Uh, with that, let's vote. Patra? Yes. Ortiz? Aye. Kamei? Aye. Torres? Aye. Foley? Aye. Passes 5-0. Great. Moving on to the next report item, which is the Berryessa Flea Market Status Report. This is a biannual update. Nancy, I assume you're kicking us off with Aldolfo in present. Thank you, Carlos. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Happy to be here today with you. We're here to share the work we've been doing, and I want to um, acknowledge Roberto, who is the president of the uh, Vendors Association, Flea Market Vendors Association. We work in very close uh, partnership with him and the other vendors. So we're excited to tell you what we've done and what are our next pieces that we're working on and some of the challenges that we need to bring forward solutions to, hopefully. Thank you, Nancy, good afternoon. Uh, so first we're gonna start with the background of the 2021 rezoning, and we just wanna give an update to on uh, some of the vendor support and outreach that we had been doing, along with the summary of the flea market advisory group meetings and finishing up with the property quarterly report Property Owners Quarterly Report, thank you. So as you guys know, on uh, 2021, uh, the flea market, various flea market underwent a rezoning. Aimed, um, and from that rezoning um, project, sorry, apologize. 
the 2021 uh, rezoning project in included many provisions intended to support the vendors as uh, a transition from the current flea market to its next phase. Uh, council instructed OED staff to engage vendors and provide small business support to the flea market vendors. The property owner so far had con was directed to contribute $5 million in three payments to the vendor transition fund with an additional $2.5 million from the city totaling a $7.5 million fund. Additionally, city staff was advised to create an advisory group to provide vendors with a meaningful voice in the allocation of the transition fund. And we have received the first $500,000 from the property owner, and initial fund, init the initial funding has been, then it has been allocated to support the studies on uh, the potential new market sites, economic and social impacts, and operating models either on the current site or somewhere else. In December of 2022, City Council approved a comprehensive program designed to support Berryessa flea market businesses. This program includes vendor support loans and technical assistance. The program's implementation was entrusted to Mission Asset Fund, a local nonprofit organization with a track record of aiding small business in achieving sustainable success. Mission Asset Fund involvement extends to offering technical assistance, including services such as business planning, credit building, support for business expansion, and personalized guidance. In a strategic move to enhance accessibility to its services, Mission Asset Fund has established a permanent booth at the Berryessa flea market, serving as a centralized hub for vendor engagement. Outreach endeavors thus far have yielded 30 outreach events, 101 vendor leads, and 117 one-on-one -on -one coaching, co coaching sessions, and 31 loan applications have been successfully completed, underscoring the tangible impact of the program on facilitating business expansion and promoting financial stability. The advisory group is our primary means of engaging with the vendor community during the transition planning process. However, we have also employed additional communication methods to keep vendors informed. These include stall-to-stall -stall outreach at the Berryessa flea market sharing summaries of advisory group discussions, regular email updates to provide meeting reminders, materials and updates, and a vendor website that serves as a valuable hub of information. This web, web page is consistently updated, offering comprehensive background information and updates on the advisory group meetings and vendor support. These communication channels ensure transparency and engagement as we collaborate on the various flea market transition. Three advisory group meetings have been held since May 2023. The first meet, an initial gathering of the, the first meeting of the advisory group happened mid May 20, May 2023. Uh, our focus was on orienting advisory group members by sharing the group's purpose, setting expectations for its members, and providing an update on the transition fund. During this meeting, we received valuable feedback from both advisory group members and the public, emphasizing the importance of supporting the vendor community, particularly in the light of uncertainty surrounding its future, and identifying potential solutions for the relocation of vendors as quickly as possible. During our, our second meeting on June 21, 2023, uh, this meeting was held via Zoom. During this session, we delved into preliminary insights gleaned from the flea markets, economics, and cultural impact study currently underway. In addition, staff provided an overview of the methodology being used for the alternative size, site study and discussed some fundamental real estate basics. Notably, we learned that the Berryessa flea market is home to over 460 businesses, making it one of the densest concentration of small businesses in San Jose, if not the entire Bay Area. This statistic underscored the market 
market's dual role, not only as a major employment center, ranking it among the top 50 employers in San Jose, but also as a vital cultural anchor in the community. Following the presentation, advisory group members engage in a discussion, asking questions and providing feedback on the data points presented. This exchange was instrumental in triggering additional analysis and survey work by both staffs and consultants aimed at gaining a deeper understanding of the flea market ecosystem. This work is still ongoing. For the remaining advisory group meetings, some of the upcoming topics that we will be talking about and discussing will be interim and long-term site considerations, the final economic and operational studies, and discuss implementation of the transition fund. And I would like to apologize. I accidentally went a little ahead and completely forgot to summarize the last meeting. <laughs> so lastly, the most uh, recent meeting, I'm just gonna give you an update, it was held on September 7th. Uh, based on the feedback from the advisory group members at the June meeting, uh, we returned to an in-person setting. Uh, as at the gathering, we delve into the early findings of the alternative site studies, which was conducted, was conducted by consultant David Grinsfelder of Grunsfelder Commercial Real Estate. The study covered eight sites, including three city-owned locations, the Singleton and Remillard landfills, and, land, and the land near Morgan Hill. Parameters such as location, considering trade area, demographics, and traffic patterns, facility attribu attributes, size, parking, access, and high level of feasibility, including potential cost, issues, and revenue, were discussed for each location. Of particular, of particular interest to the advisory group members was the possibility of using the city-owned Singleton site as a potential long-term solution. Additionally, the former Sears building at Eastridge Mall and the Santa Clara Fairgrounds were considered as potential short-term solutions. During these discussions, member inquired about decision-making timelines and potential relocation costs for, for vendors. The central theme of their feedback revolve around the desire to preserve the unique vendor culture of the market, no matter what it may, rest, no matter where, where it may be reestablished. Now I'm just gonna move to the quarterly status report. As previously directed by council, the owner is required to submit quarterly reports to the city to summarize the latest activities related to the redevelopment of the site and for staff to share the re these reports twice a year at this committee. I would like to note that a couple of days ago we received the October um, quarterly report, so this is the July, but I'm going to give you a verbal update, which um, essentially the update is that the, the rezoning re requires the property owners to provide written notice at least one year in advance of closing the flea market, which and it was July 1st, 2023, was the soonest they could provide this notice. However, the property owners stated in, this, in their most recently quarterly report that they are vol voluntarily pushing the date to January 1st, 2024, meaning that the soonest the market could close is January 1st, 2025. This doesn't mean that the market will close at that time. In fact, the owners do not know when they will close also, the application for a master plan development permit and tentative map is currently pending resubmission from the applicant. Approval of this application will enable subdivision of the site and phase infrastructure consistent with the site layout established through the rezoning. And now I'll pass this to Nancy for a conclusion. Thank you very much, Adolfo. And council, I just wanted to, uh, committee. I just wanted to share a couple more things. Um, Pulga is a very, very special location. I think we all know that. Sometimes because something has been with us a long time, it perhaps is a little easy to take for granted. But those 450, 60 um, businesses are at least 1,000 jobs. 
we have our own very um, successful business incubator and we really don't want to lose it if we can in any way find a way to, to keep it. And we have been looking at different opportunities. Carlos mentioned um, the, the loan program that is in, engaged now, and partly that's been super successful. Uh, we want to get more folks to engage with us. We're continuing to seek others, perhaps, um, who aren't as scary as government types, to um, make sure there's an openness when, when we go out or even the Mission Asset Fund folks go out. Uh, they're, they're, they're not someone they've known for a long time. So we want to look at ways of how to bridge those gaps so people will talk to uh, Mission Asset Fund about their business and what technical assistance they need and what dollars they meet, might be well served uh, strategically to have in going forward. Um, so that is something we continue to do is look how we can do what we're doing better. Also looking at Mission Asset Fund as an organization who, uh, the way we structure this is providing 0% loans and you don't have to be a citizen to take advantage of those loans. So we hope to use this as a model that we can deploy on the east side and other areas of San Jose. So we're trying to do two firsts. Uh, and there are several other groups like Latino Business Forum Foundation and um, Mimi and Excite and others who, who are very much engaged. This is with uh, 1,000 people, 450 businesses. Uh, a lot of people who need assistance. Um, so we're, we're very grateful to all of them. I also just want to mention a little bit more. We, we, in our site selection, we really were looking at um, all the things that Adolfo mentioned, but in particular, sites that can be successful as a retail site, and hopefully site a site, if possible, that we own. And the reason for doing that is that drives down costs and increases possibility. Um, I'm also happy to say, um, maybe somewhat tantalizing, we do have a very well-known local architect who's going to provide po pro bono assistance um, on how to develop program and what can go and what estimated costs would be, uh, both on Singleton and in Sears. So trying to look for relationships to further the cause because any type of relocation for 460 plus businesses is very significant. So we're using our relationships and people are thus far have been very willing to, to they see it as a very important part of our community. So the hardest part is we, we don't know that we're ultimately going to be successful, that we can achieve any type of move um, and achieve the dollars that are needed to create a move. So we want to be very upfront and honest, uh, but just wanting to share that with you. And I know Roberto's here, and we certainly talked about that along with the other um, vendors in the advisory group and beyond. With that, thank you for your patience. Just wanted to share all that we're doing. Great. Thank you for the presentation. Let's go to comments from members of the public. We'll start with in person. I have Roberto. Hi, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Roberto Gonzalez, President with the Berryessa Flea Market Vendors Association. Here just to uplift the work that OED and specifically the two to my left, Nancy and Adolfo, have been doing uh, throughout this process with the flea market as well as all the commitment and hard work from the advisory board members. Um, and just really happy to see this process roll out. Um, it's been a long process and we do see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel with uh, possibilities of alternate sites, but just being um, conscious that come January of next year, so two months or two and a half months from now, we can potentially get a one-year notice of eviction. So just having that sense of urgency and 
to quote the real estate consultant, you know, this has to happen sooner than later. Um, and of course, there are some speed bumps with all the sites. No site is perfect, but just understanding that it has to be a collaborative effort, uh, which it feels like it has been so far, but it's gonna take a lot of entities and um, soon enough, you all in council will have to make a, a big decision, right? To help these 460 plus businesses and the potential of saving something that's not just cultural, but uh, an economic incubator, um, like Nancy mentioned as well. And just making sure that we set up vendors um, in the driver's seat for these decision makings and any future market that is established, um, because I'm God willing it will be <laughs> established again. Um, the vendors will be able to run and operate that market and make decisions that affect their businesses and not have a top-down structure where we're just um, at the will and mercy of one sole property owner. So thank you so much. We'll move to online. Paul. Paul. Okay, we'll move on to Blair. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for this item. Thanks a lot for the public comment from the first public comment person. Uh, it's nice to learn that, um, you know, a, an alternate site can, can uh, be a way for vendors themselves to have control over their space and make decisions and such. That's interesting. That's really, I did not know that. Um, I wish I'd been attending the, these meetings more uh, this year. I have not. And um, just a real good luck in this work. I mean, the flea market, I'm, I'm 50 years old. The flea market has always been a part of my life. I, I've, I'm from the Mid-Peninsula originally in Palo Alto and Menlo Park. And the uh, flea market has always been in my on my mind when I think of San Jose. I mean, it's a really important identifier. It'll be sad to lose it. I've always hoped that, you know, you can consider the ideas of, of vendors themselves helping develop the future of what the uh, current flea market site will eventually look like and have architectural design help and uh, landscaping help and, and, you know, spatial help and how to des design and define the area and not make it so much of a continuing effort of office business military industrial complex thing but turn it more into a you know a, the, the past of the flea market into the future of what we want to do with our lives and and what that can be so good luck in how and vendors can help help in design of the current uh flea market process i think that's important and thankfully that you know all my early worries uh in the past few years of earthquake in in this area uh at this time it's not happening, thankfully, but it, we do have to be considering in the next few years. I hope in the planning of the of the ending the flea market vending that it may have to coordinate with with earthquake uh, preparedness. Good luck in those sort of efforts as well. Thank you, Eric. Good afternoon, good afternoon, Chair Foley, members of the committee. My name is Eric Shainauer, and I represent the flea market business owner and property owner. Uh, we just wanted to take the time to thank city staff um, as well as the vendors who are committing all of the time to the um, vendor advisory group and are doing the hard work for planning for the future. Um, uh, first of all, the Office of Economic Development is doing a great job providing services today to vendors that were never provided before, even though the vendors have been there for 60 plus years. So um, that's a good thing. And then the city and its consultants, along with the vendor advisory group, are planning for a new lo location. And if the decisions are done properly, um, they will achieve the vision that Roberto alluded to, and that is to have a site that preserves the flea market operation for the long term and also um, can create a mechanism for autonomy and self-governing by the, the, the vendors in the operation of the market. And uh, I know that's been expressed as a, as a goal and a priority 
from the vendor community. And this process uh, could allow all of that to, to happen. And so as the current owners, we hope to um, just support the process um, as we can and look forward to a favorable outcome for everybody. Thank you. Paul put his hand back up. I'll try one more time. Paul. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that courtesy of, of doubling back. Uh, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, I, there's, there is a responsibility that Mr. Schoenhauer bears in this gentrification of the uh, business owners there at the free market. They, they were not vendors. And I take great exception at classifying business owners at Berryessa as vendors. They are business owners. You see, and language is critically important because when you start re referencing as vendors, it's like if, there are people that worked there for over 30 years. I doubt that that classifies as a vendor. So there's a cultural loss, there's a significant economic loss, and the viability of those uh, business owners that were that, that they kept the flea market going. Now they are in a vulnerable position. Now, Mr. Schoenauer, I believe, in my estimation, has a, has a, has a responsibility to ensure that the business owners are established. And, and I don't mean by the law. I don't care about the law. What I care about is that you do the right thing. Doing the right thing doesn't necessitate a law. It really doesn't. And you, just by virtue of removing all of the business owners out of there and they, them losing their, their livelihoods, and then in the next sentence, this city will promote businesses downtown and do absolutely everything that it has to within its power in order to support those businesses. Now, there's a bit of a contradiction there and a little bit of a hypocrisy. So what I would, and, and also I would like to thank Robert Gonzalez. He has been a very responsible steward all the whole time. Kewale, Robert. Back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna start with Council Member Ortiz instead of ending up with him if he has any comments that he'd like to make. I, I appreciate that, Chairwoman, thank you. And I do have some comments, so I really appreciate that. Um, I wanted to first just uh, start my comments by thanking staff uh, for putting this report together, um, as well as your continued dedication to working in collaboration with the flea market vendors to help make sure that the um, transition uh, and the finding of a new location for the vendors um, is as uh, easy as possible, given that it will be um, uh, a major Im Im impediment uh, to, to those businesses. Uh, this is something that was, in, in this process, justice for vendors, for street vendors, and, and what would the future look like for them uh, for the closure of, of the flea market was important to me as an activist for even before I was running for city council, and it's so important to me uh, now. Um, I know that we were looking into the dollar amounts that uh, essentially will be dedicated uh, to uh, the vendors. I know that the city has pledged uh, 2.5 million and the owners, I believe, have pledged 5 million. But I'm also aware that the owners have essentially put contingencies uh, for these funds, one of them being that uh, the, phone, the funds will not be accessible until the actual flea market uh, is closed, which uh, I know can be hard because we're trying to make the decisions for transitioning some of these businesses today. Um, I also know that there's been decisions made by leadership at the flea market that have resulted in displacement of small businesses uh, that exist there. Some being raising the pricing on uh, parking to visit the site. Another would be uh, raising the pricing for uh, renting a, a plot or, or parcel, whatever we're calling it, uh, a vendor's space um, at the site. All that, both of those decisions have, have resulted in um, flea market vendors being displaced before the overall closure or the one year notice um, 
of the closure of the, of the flea market. So I, it, it would help me to know the, this dollars, the 2.5 million and the five, the 5 million that are available. How, did we do like a point in time audit of the businesses that existed? Uh, um, and those businesses will, the, those businesses that were audited or, or taken down will be um, viable for these, for these dollars, or will it be only the businesses who still exist on the flea market uh, um, when you know the announcement is made to close the, the flea market? What what other sort of contingencies are, are there for the, for these dollars essentially? Because what I what I would hope is there's 460 today, 30 leave. You know who knows about the 30 that left earlier? You know last year, earlier this year, or or last year. Are these businesses essentially losing that opportunity uh, to get the, the, these financial support? Councilmember, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. Um, how the dollars will be distributed is very much going to be a topic with the vendor committee and the vendors community and small businesses. I agree they are definitely businesses. So that conversation has not begun in earnest. We have not taken a point in time. I know that several of us, groups of us, have discussed that we'll need a conversation if we are to find a, an ability to move. The dollars could be dedicated to securing the move, and there are many costs that would fall into that, tenant improvements, moving costs, all kinds of things. Um, and or if there's gonna be a discussion from um, the vendor committee and the community that some vendors may want to do something else, and do they get a certain amount of money out of the dollars available to do that? So to, to Council Member Ortiz's um, good question, we haven't put a stake in the ground uh, about timing and where we count and who we don't, and um, we're not that far away from a conversation about such topics with the vendor community, the small business community. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that, I hope you can, I hope there can be intentional thought given to that topic because I would hope that, you know, business, a, a vendor that, that had been there for 30 plus years but happened to, you know, see their, their clientele decrease at the flea market due to them not wanting to pay more for the parking spaces or them not making enough, you know, this, this, at, during the home stretch to continue on as a flea market vendor and then essentially be denied any sort of service or any sort of priority, prior, priority space in the new flea market just because we weren't intentional to like put together some sort of database of all, of all the vendors yet. So um, I'm hoping that uh, those individuals uh, will still receive the same advocacy and support from the city, um, just like those who are able to, to hold on uh, uh, at, the, at the site. Um, on, a, on, a, on, a, on another note, being conscious of the potential one-year ev eviction uh, notice given uh, as early as uh, January 2024, are we looking to partner with any private public foundation to help us establish the, the new market? Thank you again for the question. We are hoping that we have a viable approach and by all means, we've had preliminary conversations with Knight and Hewlett and Packard um, to, to see, and Sobrato to see if there might be interest. And so the, the pretty much resoundingly, um, the response has been, please, we, we might be interested. Please bring something that's more concrete so that we can assess it. Thank you. I imagine that this is a, a huge project. It's probably one of the bigger open air markets. You know, it is the, open, the largest open air market in Northern California. I imagine that these foundations will want to attach their name to it. They'd want to be seen as, um, you know, organizations that are supporting immigrant owned uh, uh, communities of color owned, owned businesses. So I think this is, it's an opportunity to work with them. So I'm really glad that um, you're reaching out in, the, in that aspect. So I, I just want to reiterate, you know, the importance of, you know, whatever uh, or wherever the new iteration of the flea market is and, and how it's created. 
um, that that process needs to continue to be centered around vendors in the decision making process um, and that it, it it should be given as much authority um, if not make them the decision maker uh, uh, in those spaces so thank you thank you council member uh, this conversation is uh, really important for us to have and I I appreciate the terminology referring to the vendors as small business owners as, as the former my husband had a flea market small business a long time ago and uh, I don't think he ever would have called himself a vendor he referred to himself as a small business owner and you you live uh, very much at the whim of the community walking by your stall and and buying uh, your whatever it is that you have to sell. His business was called TV Connections back in the day when you needed connectors and things like that. It's, uh, it, it evolved, we, he had that for I think about 10, 15 years. So this conversation is a little, uh, sends me back a lot into the memory banks of the 80s and what we were doing and how we were getting by and struggling to get by and even how we moved from an outdoor flea market business to an indoor flea market business uh, in a, a, an exploration that was happening in Santa Clara at a warehouse. So I'm a little concerned about an indoor flea market because it doesn't have the same feel or vibe as an outdoor, although you don't have the weather issues either as an outdoor flea market where you're more dependent on good weather and uh, rain can really hurt things and the cold can really hurt things. So I, I'm really uh, very interested in the sites that we're selecting or that we're looking at that we're able to move forward and house these 460 businesses. I do wanna say, and I, I'll get to my colleagues in just a minute, I, I wanna say that initially when I read the presentation online over the weekend, I thought it said, the uh, flea market business was not going to provide advance notice. And I read that as meaning they were never going to provide advance notice. What they're not, what you really said, and I heard it this time, they're not ad offering it yet. And that means they're still, they don't have, the, the businesses do not have the one year notice. They may have it in January, they may not get it in January. Really depends on conditions of the developer really going forward. So uh, there, there's hope with that, but there's still timing and uh, I encourage us to move as quickly as possible to find an alternate site that works for the businesses there. Uh, thank you. With that, I'll uh, move to my colleagues, Council Member Torres. Great. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. I wanna thank Nancy and Adolfo uh, and other staff for the report. And of course, uh, Roberto for making sure our La Pulga small businesses are at the table on deciding their future. So we know that as a city, we cannot lose La Pulga. It just means so much to many of us, whether you're on this dais or on the audience or on Zoom or anywhere else in the city of San Jose, right? It's very important for our, for our local economy but it's also very important for our, for our history. And so I think that is, it's very important that we find a location for La Pulga. Uh, and so with that, I have a couple of questions. And so one of them is, I know that we are offering short-term solutions as well, right? One of the short-term solu solutions is the Sears on, at Eastridge. Right, and I know I, um, Council Member Foley just talked about it, right? It sounds like a good location, but it's not, it doesn't, it wouldn't feel like, like La Pulga because it's not outdoors, right? And so um, that is important. The long, the question is if we set our, vend, our I want to say vendors, if we set up La Pulga at a temporary location, right, we are still gonna assist them when we find a location for them long-term wise, right? Thank you very much, Councilmember Torres. There are a lot of hard questions to be asked 
and answered. That's one of them. Um, it may be possible we're talking to the owner of the Sears building. It, it may be possible to have the vendors there even 15 to 20 years. It, I'm not saying that is for sure doable, but it is a consideration. Mm -hmm. And at that time, we would need to ask council, um, does it continue to be our responsibility? And council members may decide yes or no. Um, we are, just, on, just so you know, in the world of retail, and some of you know this, there's a possibility that part of vendor, uh, small business activity could be included on the parking lot. But the Eastridge Mall does have what is referred to as CCNRs, conditions um, that the other owners have say so. And JCPenney, for example, does have approval rights. So it could be that we can appeal to them and they would be interested in having the many people who are coming to the Pulga and Cross Shop. But they may say no as well, and that comes out of corporate, so we may well be asking for help. So the, the Eastridge opportunity could be longer than you might think of as temporary, uh, and then there are a set of questions. Um, the other, in looking at Singleton, which, which we like because it, we own it, um, and we like it because um, it's got a great retail presence on Capitol, uh, not too dissimilar from what the Pulga currently has. But the questions there, in part, are gonna be money and time. Because it's a landfill, you have to reopen the landfill. The costs associated with that and the time to do it, um, depending on who's giving the answer to, to get in, maybe, well, take five to six years. So th that is why we are putting a lot of elbow grease, as you know, into this work. And yeah, there's no. several yeah. others on the OED team, Blage and Vic yeah. and others, who, who are working on the project, um, Jessica Munoz. But um, we just don't have enough answers. And I don't want to over-promise. We try to under-promise and over-deliver. And there isn't a certain end here, as important as it is, and I just want to make sure we're as upfront about that as possible. Yeah, no, no, these are, these are gonna, thank you for your answers, by the way. These are, these are gonna be brutal conversations, because we, we, this is a very complicated issue, right? But again, we also don't want to let our small business owners of La Pulga to be, you know, out there, Fending for themselves, right? We, we 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 need to do this right, and I hope that we 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 do do it right, and we find a location for them, uh, ASAP. And uh, my last question, and then I'm, I'll you I'll motion to support is, um, are we are we using any of the of the folks at La Pulga to to help us fill in the 65 plus vacant storefronts in downtown, even just temporarily? We're just starting on the pop-up program in the downtown because we just finished the downtown contract, the actual getting all the paperwork done. So that, that certainly is, we're working with Ryan who did Moment. So that's part of the consideration of who might go. We um, also are partnering with Roberto, Dis your office, thank you very much, and D6 in sure. terms of um, Plaza Azul and the Roberto and, and others from Pulga are there every, with us every Tuesday. So we are looking for creative opportunities to include the small businesses from La Pulga wherever we can. Okay, great. And then um, with that, I motion to, to, to accept item D2. Second. Great, thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the report. Um, I, I heard uh, in terms of looking at um, different locations, it, it's all gonna take time. And I think that just has been mentioned uh, by Roberto that we definitely need to kind of like move forward. Uh, things always take more time than you ever think it's gonna take. And um, you know, 2024 is around the corner. So, I'm just wondering, it sounds like there's a um, sort of leaning towards the Singleton site. I was curious, how big is the site? And 
Uh, I know it's been sort of like there, not doing very much, and you know, I'm just wondering um, what what you're thinking in terms of, of, of what, what we're able to do with that kind of site. Um, will it fit everybody there or not? I also heard something about a place near Morgan Hill, and I hadn't heard that before, so I was just curious as to where and you know, a little bit more information on the Singleton site, because it seems to me that um, it's gonna take, remediation of that site is gonna take time, right? And I don't know, I, I thought you said maybe five to six years. <laughs> and whether it's for this use, another use, whatever it is that we wanna do with it, I, I don't know how we kinda put it on the radar, not to just leave it as is, but to actually utilize it. So I, I'm, I'm just curious as to what you're thinking in terms of, of looking at the site. Uh, because if it is, in fact, five to six years down the line, it's not practical. It's not even practical to say that this is going to be the site for La Pulga uh, if you have to spend five to six years to remediate it. That's just too long. Vice but, Mayor. but there may be something I'm not seeing. I don't, I don't know. Thank you very much, Vice Mayor and, and Madam Chair. So five to six years till date of occupancy. Oh, I not see. Not just remediation. And, and there are some who believe we could knock some time off that. Depends on who's doing the work. Um, so. And that's all due to remediation? Well, I love Singleton. There's going to be a use. There's many, there's two really good fish stories about the ones that got away that were, had, we had designs on that site. Um, so it will be put to good use, and this would be a good use overall. Singleton is 90 acres, uh, 85 to 90 acres. Um, so it's a considerable piece of, of property that the city owns. The challenge is it, it is a, a landfill, a closed landfill. So it, it's the best little landfill you ever want to find, is the way we think about it, because it's a household landfill. It was never uh, uh, an industrial landfill and the city had had good thought and put 20 to 30 foot of fill over the whole thing already, which is really helpful. But opening it up to current standards to allow people to be on it for many hours a day, have to go through multiple agencies on the state and local level. That takes some coordination. And then putting water through it, um, sewer, t sewer and sanitary uh, and uh, overflow water, Anytime you're going through a landfill, you really want to over-design, well-design, so you're not leaking in and leaching out um, um, hazmat of some sort or another. So there's, that's just one example of the, the kind of analysis, the engineering and then construction that needs to be thoughtfully done. So um, that's why it'll be great to get the architect on who, can, who has knowledge and can help us run through what program we would generally need, not a super detailed, but a, a smart program, and then determine uh, what is needed and costs, rough order of magnitude of costs. Same with Sears, because it's not clear what can be done inside of Sears. Sears wasn't set up for um, venting and grease traps, so I don't know that there could be any food uses inside Sears. Um, that's one of the important things to take a look at to see if it would be desirable for the vendors or not. Yeah, I'm, I'm in agreement with our, our chairwoman uh, in terms of it's not the same uh, having something indoors versus you know an open market. Uh, but I, I do think that um, if Singleton is a possibility, then um, you mentioned putting up you know like having the architect to me having a soil scientist or someone who could give us the geology of the um, area in terms of what's possible. Um, because it's such a big site, maybe you do it in stages. Um, I know these things take years, but if you never start, uh, you know, the time clock just keeps going. Um, and I'd like to hear a little bit more about the one that's close to Morgan Hill. Ah, thank you. Um, 
thank you again for the question. So I want to assure you that San Jose is blessed with a team in Environmental Service Department who's exceedingly good. Jeff Blair on HAZMAT leads that team and we have been in close communication with Jeff and have some order of magnitude critical past steps and costs associated with that to be sharing with the architect for their inclusion in, in their preliminary thinking through the site. So we're trying to use all the resources we can but really appreciate the input because we want to make sure we're covering as many bases as we can. The, the issue, we own 60, 70 acres um, off Monterey right by Sobrato High School. The issue with that is, is a couple fold. One is that um, it's a lousy retail site. So I don't know that we would be serving the small business as well by suggesting that location. And from a CEQA point of view, and Rosalind would know far more than I or Johnny, um, our move to vehicle miles traveled might make it very hard to have such a use approved. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Batra. Thank you, Chairperson. And uh, Nancy, thanks for giving a good rundown on the report. And I think you've got two major challenges right now. One is this project, getting 450 small businesses to be relocated and staying prosperous. You also have that other one, which is the retail space not being properly or fully utilized in downtown. Are there some businesses out of these have graduated enough to really be occupying the space in downtown? Uh, their nature might be such that they could fully operate. In fact, they could be more vibrant in downtown. It's a great question. There's, there's more work to be done there. One of the details, and we'll have a more complete rundown from the economic and cultural reports at an upcoming report. But what we found so far is at least 30 to 40 percent of the small businesses at Pulga um, are self-sustaining just working at Pulga. So it's not a second job. Lots of the businesses work someplace else during the week and on the weekend they come to Pulga. But fully 30 to 40 percent survive as their mainstay from those uh, small businesses, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's the critical mass, it's the there there that draws all of the folks down. So I genuinely don't know at this moment if downtown would suffice. That's some of the looking we need to do and it will depend very much on the location of the downtown potential spot and the business uh, uh, from La Pulga. So, so I'm glad that you're trying to do that matchmaking if there is such a possibility, because whatever number of businesses can survive in downtown or flourish, not even survive in downtown, serves two objectives for us. One, we have to look for fewer places elsewhere. And secondly, we also fill up our downtown space. So I'm glad that you're already doing it and let's give some priority to see if we can do any matchmaking there, okay? Thank you. Thank you, let's vote. Batra? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Kame? Aye. Torres? Aye. Foley? Aye. Thank you, passes 5-0. Thank you, thank you for that presentation. Last item is the Local Small Business Contracting Participation Annual Report. We have a whole team approaching us. Good afternoon, Chair, committee members. My name is Jay Guevara, Deputy Director of Public Works, and I have the pleasure of joined by my colleagues, Albi Udam, Deputy Director in Finance, 
Department, Warren Profit, Program Manager, Public Works, CIP, Capital Improvement Program, and Fletcher Barnes, Program Manager in Finance. As a bit of background for our conversation this afternoon, I'd like to remind the committee that the city is decentralized in our procurement model. Public Works Department is responsible for procuring major public works contracts for all three CIP departments. That includes Public Works, Environmental Services, Department of Transportation. Public Works contracts are essentially construction contracts. By contrast, all departments are responsible for their professional consulting services procurements. And finally, the Finance Department and Purchasing is responsible for everything else. Before we review the data for fiscal year 2022 to 2023, I want to highlight three things. Number one, let me advance the slide. Number one, the, pro the Public Works Department is committed to maximizing the potential local and small business impact in our procurements. We accomplish this by increasing successful local and small business procurement through refining our process improvements and sustaining our considerable outreach and education efforts with the contractor community. Number two, Public Works is split between two broad categories that set the field of influence for local and small businesses with major and minor Public Works. By that, I mean major Public Works in this reporting period are defined at the value of more than $740,000 and minor Public Works are those valued less than $740,000. Finally, number three, let's define what we mean by local and what we mean by a small business. In this conversation, a local business must have an office, it could be at headquarter or a satellite office, located in Santa Clara County with at least one employee and a valid city business tax license. A small business must be a local business that also has 35 or fewer employees. So, I will now proceed to review major public works contracts and then go on to minor. For major public works contracts during this reporting period, our report presents data for both the number of contracts and the dollar value, as well as the percentage. And in comparing these, I suggest that the dollar value may be the most meaningful metric. So, 247 million construction contract dollars, 37% of which went to local businesses, 19% of those dollars went to small businesses. That is comprised of 58 construction contract awards. A full third went to local businesses, whereas 19% went to small businesses. In bar graph, the city saw a slight decrease in the percentage of major public works contracts awarded to local and local small business contractors compared to previous year. However, in real terms, the amount of dollars increased from 44 million to 92 million. Storm, sewer, and wastewater projects, which make up a significant number of the year's work, have the lowest percentage of local and small and local small contract awards. The low number of contract awards could be due to a limited number of local and small businesses that have the ability or can meet the experience requirement to perform this specialty work. The year's highest value contract, a new airport facilities building valued at 27.7 million, was awarded to a local business. Now I'm transitioning to the minor public works contracts. Focusing on the dollar value, Minor Public Works with the 17.4 construction, 17.4 million construction dollars, 78% of those dollars went to local businesses, whereas 36% of the dollars went to small businesses. That is comprised through 37 construction contract awards, where 68% of the contracts went to local businesses, and 27% of the contracts went to small businesses.
percentage of minor public works contracts awarded to local and small contractors increased. Pavement-related projects, specifically Americans with Disabilities Act ramp projects and trail development projects, have a high percentage of local and local small business contract awards. Historically, we see there is a robust pool of contractors who perform this minor public contracts work. The Public Works Department continues to evaluate and adapt public works contracting program through three primary components. One, the online construction, construction contracting seminar. We provided this initially in 2019 and have offered a six week construction academy to teach contractors how to navigate a public works construction project form from bidding to close out. In 2022, the program went digital, allowing contractors to access the contact on demand. Number two, Meet the Primes event. We conducted this event for the first time in 2022, and we have scheduled for February of 2024 our next version of Meet the Primes. Number three, local and small business preference. As a matter of policy, this applies only to minor public works contracts. It was increased from an initial 5% and now has an additional 5% as of June 2022. This changed the result approximately 16% of minor public works contract awards with that full, the 5 and 5% respectively. And pictured on the right, we have our first pamphlet in English and will be translated into Spanish and Vietnamese shortly where we're providing additional literature and forms of outreach to um, make sure that our com contractor community is informed how they can educate and pursue this, this opportunity. With that, I'd like to turn over to our colleagues in the finance department. Thank you, Jay. <clears throat> Thank you, council members and council chair. My name is Albi Udom. Deputy Director of Finance in charge of purchasing and risk management. I am here to talk about the purchasing department's activities with local businesses. As you can see from the slide, in the last fiscal year, we spent about $340 million um, total for um, our contracts and purchasers. Of that amount, 32% went to businesses that are located in Santa Clara County. And 6% of that amount went to businesses that are classified as local and small businesses, given the definition that my colleague Jay had put up earlier. Looking at total awards, there were 1,631 awards, of which 18% of that went to local businesses in Santa Clara County, and 4% went to um, local and small businesses. There were also about $17.3 million spent through P the PCAD program, which we administer, but is totally within the control of departments. This bar graph shows the breakdown of the um, dollar spent as it compares to um, local businesses and small businesses. As you can see, contract, uh, contracts and purchase orders to dollars, 33% from fiscal 18-19, uh, dropped to 25% in 1920, went up to 2021, went up in 2021 to 31%, came down a little bit in 2021-22, and last fiscal year went up to 32%. The amount, the percentage for small and local businesses tracked about the same percentage over the period. This slide shows the contracts and total peer awards. Again, when you look at it, it fluctuates between the years. But in the last year, it actually went up a little bit. The amount for local and small businesses, the percentage for local and small businesses stayed about the same for the last three years. S 
So the finance department has a, some resources, what we call our touch points, to try and reach out to local businesses. We have our public resources on our website, on a portal, which is accessible to um, businesses that want to do business with the city. We have our outreach events, which we do regularly. Uh, the last one being the, um, where the collaboration with the uh, Office of Economic Development, where we prepared a flyer, uh, a newsletter on how to do business with the city, and that was translated into multiple languages. We are also partnering with Public Works in the uh, Mid the Primes event coming up next year. And then lastly, we have a procurement system, the e-procurement e process, the bidding go, which all our bids are posted and it's open to anybody that wants to um, look at it and find out some more. Additionally, businesses can reach out to us for any questions. And with that, I'll conclude the presentation. Open to any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Let's go to members of the public first. Paul. Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Thank you for that report. It was good to have it outlined as clearly and uh, directly as to what qualifies as a business, what qualifies as a, you know, that, that was very uh, educational and necessary. The numbers that you have that are getting public works contracts is too low. It's, it, it's just too low. Now, one of the main issues that was a part of the Chicano movement was city contracts. Now, when model cities, when we got the money for model cities in order to build the Center for Performing Arts, Confederación de la Raza Unida and the Black Berets were there with Chemo Candeleria challenging the city and pushing back because there was no Mexicans being hired for that job, for Center for Performing Arts. So there's a, there's a long history of discriminatory practices within the context of public works contracts. Now, I'm not saying that that's happening now, but those numbers are just too low. Now, when we talk about racial equity, I don't, I, racial equity does not mean giving Somos Mayfair a million dollars in Yavasta. We've done our due diligence. No. Racial equity is a policy and a budgetary position. And it is institutionalized when you create a budgetary process that makes viable business owners out of people that have normally been excluded and disadvantaged because of racial and economic and political uh, lack of power and resources. Now, this is very simple. So when we're talking about racial equity and talking about the institutionalization of that principle, this is one of the areas where it's most where. Blair. All right, thank you, Blair Beekman. That was some interesting explanations by Paul. Thank you, it was nice to hear. I mean, just the initial ideas of how to really use equity well is, is, is just to bring people out of places where they, they're stuck in, <laughs> basically, and to give them that advantage and that hope, basically, ways that they can work that they're not allowed to previously. So thank you, thank you for Paul's words. Uh, for myself, what I was gonna say uh, for this time, uh, uh, where, where I come from with these items, you talked a lot about procurement. Uh, I'm trying to learn as always that, you know, the, the work with tech accountability I do, if we do those practices well, um, when, when businesses, you talk with businesses and you talk about the procurement process, if you have that in your folder uh, as San Jose, what we do well, that, that attracts people. That's how we attract people to San Jose, business-wise, the future of AI-wise, uh, visitor-wise, how we bring visitors to the future of San Jose. If, if they see openness, if they see we're working in decent, good terms, uh, and, and sharing with the community, and offering community participation, and communities inviting their own input, and we're going back and forth, that's what people want to be a part of in the future, and that, that develops a procurement process that uh, further develops responsibility, uh, accountability, 
you know, all the really good things that we're, we're trying to understand and better work towards that we really need to at this time. And uh, so just my fr friendly reminder of, of those sort of subject matter. Thank you. Back to the committee. Thank you. Council Member Torres. Hi, uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for your presentation. I just have a, a couple of, I should just say, I have one question actually, um, and if there's any follow-ups then you know, I'll ask them, but um, how is our Office of uh, Equality Assurance tied into this? So our Office of Equality Assurance um, provides several resources for both of our departments. Um, public works projects have to be registered with the State Department of Industrial Relations, so they do some of that coordination for us. Um, they are the lead on the project labor agreement um, in public works, and so they make sure that our documents and our procurement uh, files are updated and have all that information. They also do our, uh, for, for both departments, um, they check for the living wage policy uh, when we accept bids. Um, so they're very closely uh, tied into all the procurement work that we do. Uh, and I'm Fletcher Barnes, a program manager, finance purchasing. Um, to add to what Lauren said, oh, sorry, to add to what Lauren said, um, so every uh, solicitation we do that involves services, um, OEA is part of that and they provide a labor determination um, that we include with the bid. Um, so that outlines if the prevailing wage applies, living wage applies, um, what other city labor requirements are uh, involved. Um, we also check um, with OEA um, at the conclusion of each solicitation for compliance with the city's wage theft policy. Um, so a list of vendors is provided to OEA and they verify that they either are or are not in compliance. Um, and then throughout the life of the contracts, I know OEA also does uh, a number of different things in terms of um, payroll tracking um, uh, and other items. So um, quite, quite of, uh, we work, um, we're very happy to work with Chris's group and they, um, they do a great job. So. Great, so we, we are, as a city, making sure that we're not awarding contracts to somebody who has a clear violation of wage theft. Correct. Okay. Great. That's good to know because uh, this is uh, you know taxpayer money, and and uh, it's uh, it's really important to to let everyone know that we don't we don't want these contractors that have wage theft violations, right? Obtaining city contracts. So, great. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, and with that, I have motion to approve item D3. Second. Thank you. Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you for the report. Um, I, I, I just clarifying questions on, on the information. So the $247 million in major public works contract is only for the year 2022-23? Okay. And then this is the total number of all of the construction contracts? Okay. Um, you know, I, I think we would benefit from understanding uh, whether or not those were delivered on time and on budget, because I do understand that um, there's been a tremendous escalation in terms of materials, and, you know, there have been events where um, have been beyond the contractor's control, but I think that... Um, if we are in fact deliver, if the if they are delivering the the um, the projects on time and uh, on budget, I think it'd be a nice to you know kind of follow that in the future. So I think in future presentations that would be very valuable. And then the the other thing I want a clarification on is when we say. Uh, local businesses and we say small businesses there are some small businesses that may or may not be local so I know that in the procurement we they talked about small and local so the question for me is when I think about small and local is it both or is it one is it the you know because I think that you could have a variation to be local and small uh, so you know, just kind of like teasing that out a little bit so that I have a better understanding of, of who we are, you know, sort of dealing with. Uh, because finance put it together, 
uh, as local and small, so I'm assuming that means both, or does it mean it could be one or the other? Thank you very much for that question. Yes, it means both, because you have to be a local business to be a small business. Okay, all right. That's, that's very helpful. And then um, in terms of, uh, of uh, paralleling uh, when it's reported, it would be helpful if the two, both for public works and finance, would be the same so that we could see it following through. I had another question, and I don't know, I just don't know this. Uh, when you have a, um, a, a, a con either construction or procurement that is, um, uh, you know, larger, it's not a small business, it's not local, um, I'm just wondering if um, there is any benefit of having subcontractors that are local, small business, uh, that, they're, that they're saying, hey, you know, we're a large business, but we incorporate subcontractors who are local to the area or who are small businesses, which I think is another way of being able to benefit the local community, even though they may be a multinational or whatever. I don't know if you track that. I'm just I, curious. Uh, correct me if, if I'm on track, but uh, let me go in the same order, and I think I can respond. So. Of, of the three, number one, you will see all the on time, on budget, and the annual CIP report. And, and in fact, this might be most appropriate within that context in future cycles, where the entire procurement, the budget and delivery, all the different six phases of a CIP project are provided to you in, in that broader context. So that's where you'll see it on November 7th, coming up. Okay, okay? great, see so that's get, very helpful. Get ready. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, and number two, I like to think of the city's definition of local and local small is, uh, is kind of like back in geometry, right? A, a, a rectangle and square, right? Where, where one can be in both categories, but one can't be in, in solely on its own, right? So you need to be first local. And then if you are local, then you can also be small if it's 35 or fewer employees. You, you must have both. And then finally, uh, for the third, a great example of the subcontractor conversation is is the Meet the Primes event. So while we table collectively to encourage all of those conversations and the, and the synergy that happens at that kind of event, it's largely targeting the subcontractors to build their business network and, and build those relationships so they can be considered and, and join in on the party as a viable subcontractor. So that is definitely our target audience amongst many mm -hmm. through that specific outreach effort. Yeah, I, I think that that's absolutely wonderful. I think that's really a great thing that you're doing. Um, my, my thought was to try to um, see how much that makes a difference, you know, because I think that if you are in fact getting, you know, many who are local, that, that's a way to grow. But if you never track it, you'll never know. Right, so I just, I just think that it's something to keep an eye on uh, because I think that that interaction is very valuable, so thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation and for the information. I just had one question regarding the total awards. It was reported in a percentage, but I would really like to see it in a dollar amount too because that shows the economic impact to the small businesses and what they are generating as it relates to income from their perspective. Is that possible next time you're before us that you bring it to us both as a percentage of the awards but also what that means in dollars? Uh, yeah, we could definitely provide, provide those counts in dollar numbers as well. Okay, um, so thank you, that would be helpful. Uh, Council Member Ortiz, I didn't forget you. Do you have any comments, that, anything you'd like to add or questions? Madam Chair, appreciate it. Yes, I do. I am alone in my kitchen dining room uh, room. Uh, I, I want to thank you for the report as it's high, uh, a topic that's high of mind for me um, and, and my office. Uh, I see this as a major opportunity to be an economic driver. We could provide our own hardworking residents uh, um, support by contracting directly with them. 
Uh, many other cities, counties, and states have embedded intentional policies um, and beyond a policy goals in their procurement decisions as a means of supporting and growing their local uh, economies. Simply put, I, I want us to be leveraging our city to ensure the success of uh, local San Jose families. We are well positioned to serve as a quote unquote incubator um, for these smaller contractors. I mean, as an advocate for small businesses, I know that a single contract can mean the difference between hiring new staff, building a brand, or maybe even going from a non brick and mortar to a, a, a brick and, and mortar. So I, I have a few questions. Um, when speaking to contractors, uh, they have mentioned to me several times difficulties with the Bedingo software. I think that's how you pronounce it. Um, can you, can, I want to ask if staff can speak to any feedback that's been shared with them regarding the software. Um, thank you for the question. Um, Bedingo does provide a variety of technical resources, and we do include it in our solicitation documents right on front that if um, vendors are having any trouble that they can contact them directly. I don't have um, beyond a couple of, you know, emails here and there, someone wanting some assistance. It's not a complaint that I hear uh, with any regularity. Um, I don't know if, if purchasing has any different experience. Sure, um, I can jump in on the purchasing side. So um, similar to uh, what Lauren's, sorry, similar to what Lauren said, um, we've gotten a few emails here and there um, noting challenges with the system. Um, we try very hard to make sure that uh, vendors and our bids list a lot of, um, they have our buyer contact info, um, who is the procurement contact for the solicitation. They have bid and go. Okay, contact. well, thank you. I, I have had a few uh, oh, okay. individuals sorry. raise this with me, so, oh, okay. sorry. Were you still talking? Oh, yeah, uh, no worries. I think that about covers it. So I'll go ahead. <laughs> my apologies. My internet connection is, is going in and out. So I had thought you had finished speaking. Can you hear me now? Yep. Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just want to make sure people can hear me. Um, the report outlines that there are certain contracts that are either major majority taken up by small and local businesses, usually the pavement related projects. And then those that are simply not at all uh, uh, being essentially taken up by uh, small businesses, which is like ESD and stormwater projects. Have there been conversations to, to meet a threshold of small and local contracting for those type of projects that are um, essentially being taken up by those kind of businesses? Council member, thank you for the question. There have been conversations and, you know, with the data provided that provides five years, both across the major public works, and that's the scenario in which specialized requirements are necessary for that complex work. And it tends to be uh, larger firms with some local uh, and small noted. Whereas in contrast, the minor public works tend to provide greater participation in that data set from local and small businesses because the, the thresholds are, are, are lower, right? So we, we've discussed and at a general, in a general sense, it's very difficult to find local and small businesses that are ready and prepared to take on that difficult construction work. It is, it's complex, major public works. Uh, it requires the big equipment, uh, the administrative um, acumen and know-how to operate at multi-million dollar levels and it's not necessarily uh, easy for a local and small. Whereas the, the pavement, the American Disability Act, those are more accessible because of their size and uh, lower thresholds. So I think it's just the nature of the market and the market conditions, but we continue to outreach regardless throughout these events and uh, are always open to increasing participation, be it at major or minor public works. Thank you, P appreciate that answer. Um, I wanted to ask if the city is currently, ex have they ever thought of exploring um, a responsible employer 
uh, ordinance, which would essentially provide more weight for contractors who hire veterans or contractors who hire diverse staff um, or those who actually hire uh, uh, residents here in the city of San Jose. Because there could be, you know, I saw one of the language for a local, you know, small business. It could be a big business elsewhere, but they could have a, 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 a small, like, one-person shop here in San Jose. So that would essentially make them eligible for uh, a local small business uh, uh, to essentially be identified as a local small business. So is there any thought of like looking into, okay, do these contractors uh, employ local uh, staff or do they, do they hire communities of color or veterans right of things like that? Thank you. Uh, again, Jay Guevara, Deputy Director of Public Works. We've, we've, considered different ways to increase participation, and I've also applied learnings from, for example, other projects where there are different categories that could be awarded at, say, a federal contract. And uh, those, those types of qualifications and categories can often open up the field for participants, but it can also, as a process, make it far more difficult to apply. And in this instance, I think staff right now is continuing to consider increasing the participation, but with those different categories, we've learned from federal contracting requirements and other contexts that it can become even more burdensome to, with the intent of increasing participation, we might actually create further steps that could have an opposite effect. So it could be a burden to require contractors to hire San Jose residents? Is that what you're saying? I'm saying as a process to check and administer that, it could be, it's one more, it's one more step along the road. So happy to discuss further if you have ideas specifically on how to increase participation. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm looking forward to the results of the finance disparity study so that we can understand, you know, what is and isn't working in terms of procurement and move forward with implementing those changes um, and, and streamlining contracting and, and procurement. But I'm, I'm very much interested in making sure that um, the jobs that are created here at the city of San, San Jose can go to residents here in the city of San Jose, and especially working class families um, who have historically um, not had opportunities uh, uh, in this county. So thank you. Thank you. Seeing no further comments, let's vote. Batra? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Kame? Aye. Torres? Aye. Foley? Aye. Passes 5 0. So concludes the regular uh, CED meeting. Now we'll go to open forum. Paul? Uh, yes, Paul Soto from the Horseshoe. Uh, a very productive meeting. Very, very productive. I heard a lot of positive stuff. Really appreciated uh, Carlos's work, and I would like to extend a sincere gratitude to Councilman uh, Torres regarding his uh, comments uh, about Calle Willow. We uh, the the business district is an excellent idea. Here's the problem that I have, though. We need to talk about this. Is that there's a company in Chicago that wants to come here and is talking to the business owners and putting in their ear. That somehow oh, no, we're going to prove, we're going to prove, we're going to prove, and really that's not what they do. They come in and they completely just gentrify the area. They save the space, but the area is not a reflection of a lot of it itself. So, what I'm looking for is this: is the, to work with the city. Okay, the, I've already established the Lowrider headquarters and Sacred Heart Church, both historical landmarks right across the street from each other. That is a historic conservation district, is what it is. And you can still get the monies to improve the businesses, to 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 uh, to maintain the character of Kaya Willow. The other thing is that I would like to uh, suggest to Councilman Torres is that the banners, the banners are, are they're yellow, they're, they don't belong in an area that has that much pride. Guy Willow has a lot of pride and a lot of dignity. And we worked very hard over the past 80 years to establish that street. And so I would like some banners 
those banners in place to reflect that. Also, I would like the, the banner that's in front of uh, the banner that goes in front of the building where the first lowrider headquarters is at of Sunny Madrid. I would like Father Moriarty and Father Anthony Soto in front of uh, Sacred Heart Church. That's it. Blair. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Thanks for the meeting today. Nice words from Paul. Yeah, it was a good meeting for myself too today. Uh, thank you. Um, I, you know, thinking about it, uh, the PISPIS meeting last Thursday, I, I thought was interesting. There was an item about uh, uh, police uh, accountability, what to do about the future of police conduct issues and such. It was uh, questioned about the future of how to develop the future of police oversight. And the idea of, of, of creating some sort of outside board was not too uh, happily looked upon. Uh, I thought it could be okay, but if we use that with the intentions of moving towards the future of a uh, of a community-led public oversight body, that I, I really hope, uh, I think we had an aha moment that, uh, you know, that can be a really uh, a good thing. That's something we should be working towards. Uh, to respect the words of uh, police persons who are a bit angry at uh, former IPA Siobhan, uh, who are with messing with some sort of uh, bureaucratic paperwork. I respect their opinion. I, I don't think having oversight based on uh, police, more and more police practices is the answer though. Uh, but I respect what they had to say and good luck how we're working on, on such issues towards better accountability and understanding uh, between all of us. And with that, I hope public oversight can really be in our future. And with my remaining time, I just wanted to again comment. I, I'm really, it's very sorrowful what's going on in Israel and Gaza at this time. Uh, we're headed towards another series of, of just war. And uh, just an, a reminder that, uh, you know, as we make policy decisions here at the local level, really good luck to not use war in your thinking. Really think of concepts of peace, accountability. Uh, the work I do with tech accountability really actually lends itself towards ideas of peace, open democracy. Thank you. Caller with the name Resident. Yes, hello. Uh, I, I, my kids are being sexually abused, and um, we're gonna. A, or you can correct it and and a, a talk, comment on the record as to what we're doing at the council meeting, but that has nothing to do with this council meeting. Otherwise, we're disconnecting it does, it does you. Have to do Disconnect with it. It does you, have please. Thank you. Back to the committee. We are adjourned.